Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to the church this morning for our guests and visitors. We're glad to have you with us. Uh, just our, our hope and our prayer that you get a blessing by being with us this morning. Um, before we uh, open up in prayer, uh, I just wanted to share a little bit that God put on my heart this weekend. Um, as Christians, we are called to do and serve in a Christ-like manner, in love and service. And sometimes we get tired. Sometimes we get frustrated. Sometimes we feel that, that we're just, I want to say not appreciated, but underappreciated. Maybe we're not uh, feeling that, that what we're doing is really worth anything, that it's fulfilling anything. And we see people that don't believe that are, we feel, or it appears that they're doing so great. And uh, we just need to keep in mind what we're called to do and who we're called to be. And our scripture this morning has come out of Galatians chapter 6. And I'm going to start uh, reading from verse 7. And it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows in it to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of the faith. So as we get together for worship, VBS, which was a fantastic week, let's, you know, if you get tired or you're feeling unappreciated, look to the one that fulfills us, who gives us everything that we need. So with that, we have our prayer list. Let's keep that in mind and keep those concerns lifted up. Do we have any unspoken requests? Show up, up raise hands. A lot of hands. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the honor and the privilege we have to be in your house. Father, may we constantly seek you and your will and not our own will. Father, that we would walk the path you've put before us. Father, that we would serve in the way you've called us to serve. May we utilize the gifts that you've given us. Father, to honor and glorify you and not us. Father, when we're um, out in the community, may people truly see that we're different and we're set apart, and may they want to know why. Just given that opportunity for the Holy Spirit to speak to them through us. Father, that in all that is said and done, you would receive honor and glory. Father, we're thankful for our military, our first responders, all those that sacrifice so much. Father, for the privilege we have to worship you so freely and so openly. May you uh, guide and direct this service. We pray for our pastor. May your hand be upon him and that the message you've given him. Father, may it be spoken boldly. And Father, for those that are here this morning that don't know you, may today be the day they make that declaration of faith. Father, that angels will rejoice with a new name written in the book of life. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Victor Baptist Church. Why don't you give the Lord some glory? Come on. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. You can be seated. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, how many of you survived Vacation Bible School? <laughs> Amen. It's, it's been an amazing week, and uh, I, I just wanted to give a few highlights. One, uh, the children, and, and with the help of their, their parents and adults, they were able to raise over $400 for missions, and that is just uh, very awesome, uh, very, very cool. And uh, we, we were able to, we're going to split that offering and, and send it to two different families. One family that's serving in Guatemala as missionaries, and another family that's serving right here in America in Pittsburgh. So very excited about that. Uh, and we're going to continue to lift up uh, the White family and the, uh, the Waltman family, or uh, continue to lift them up in prayer. And also, uh, I want to let you guys know that uh, we had uh, the Gideons here uh, during our vacation Bible school, and we were able to distribute over 70 Bibles uh, this week. So that is, re that's really cool. Yeah, that's uh, very awesome. Um, uh, most, most of the kids uh, were able to go home with a Bible. And also, uh, we had over 12 decisions this week for Jesus. So, I mean, that is like, oh uh, man, that's, uh, that is very amazing. So, uh, I, I want us to do our part, and, and if you know somebody who had stepped forward that night, just continue to encourage, pray for them, and as we as a church, 
uh, to make some disciples, amen, for Jesus Christ. Uh, I wanted to mention, uh, one, we, we are looking, uh, if you're f- unfamiliar with our church, uh, every September we start new ministries. That we call it a new church year. And we uh, sometimes people shift out of roles and, and, and following the obedience of the Holy Spirit and calling. And so we do have a service opportunities form. Uh, There's a link to it in our bulletin, and we have some hard copies in the front. If you'd like to pray over it, amen, just pray over it and and sign up for maybe something that you feel God's leading you to serve in uh, so we can make a difference, amen. And so if God might be working in your heart, we'd love to connect you to a place of service here in our community. Uh, So please be in prayer for that. And uh, also, uh, I just wanted to mention that we had a fishing tournament yesterday. How many of y'all came out and fished yesterday? Any any of y'all... uh, a few of you, uh, I went with this really cool guy, Clayton, back in the back. Now, he's, he used to be a fishing guide. I don't know if I cheated or what, you know. Did that, is that cheating, Randy? Yeah. All right, amen. And, uh, and, and, man, he put us on just a really beautiful spot. And, uh, oh, no. Oh, no, man. I, uh, why did y'all do that? And, <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's actually evidence. I really caught a fish yesterday. I did, you know. Uh, pardon my hair, you know. My goodness, you know, that's like, uh, that's rough, ain't it, man? My goodness. Uh, we had a great, and I want to let y'all know, I was winning. I was winning the tournament until everyone else got there. You know, I was, uh, I was, uh, and, um, but we, the real winner, and I think was all of us, we, afterwards, we, we fellowship, we, we ate together, we had a great time, but that Skipper Murphy right there, he had a 21.11 catfish. I mean, that's some cool stuff. Man, so awesome. And uh, I, I want you all to just uh, think, think about uh, how big that fish is, amen, that's really big. Uh, and Jesus has called all of us to catch bigger ones, amen to be fishers of men, uh, but we had a, a blast yesterday. The youth raised over $300 yesterday just doing a fishing tournament. It was, it was just a great day of, of uh, fellowship and uh, loving each other, and, uh, and if you'd like to participate in something like that, we'll have some future things coming up. Uh, very, very excited what God's doing, but if, if you have not found a home or a place to serve, uh, please pray and take that step of faith. We'd love to see you make a difference in this world for Christ Jesus, but I love you all. If I could get, a, get the children to come for the children's sermon at this time. these cool little ladies right here. Man, who has children's church today? All right, Rochelle, look at you, girl. My goodness. Y'all look like y'all are going to be so good for her today. Amen. Right? They're very good. Uh, well, you know, we were just talking about fishing. Uh, have, have you all fished? Have you all, you all fished or anything? Uh, Lily, you fished? Um, very, have, you, have you caught a fish? Man, that's awesome. Um, well, what do you need to fish? What do you need? Nothing. <laughs> you know, uh, fishing rod, yes, very, Lily says you need a fishy rod and you need bait. What else do you need? Any other ideas? Well, you probably need a place to fish, amen, you, you do. And is, is, do you need a boat? No, yeah, you're right. You, you don't need a boat. You just need to find a body of water, amen. And uh, Jesus he, one, some of his first disciples were fishermen. Uh, Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he saw four men, and they were fishermen, uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and he called them to follow him. And one of them, his name was Peter, and Peter, when he saw how amazing Jesus was, how holy Jesus was, Peter actually bowed down before Jesus and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man because he just did not feel worthy to follow Jesus and do his work. And then Jesus said, fear not, I will make you a fisher of men. And I, I want to let you know that there's no person not unworthy enough to follow Jesus. All right, did you hear what I said? Not unworthy enough, right? Jesus, he's the one who makes us what? Worthy. And you know why? Because he declared it. 
he spoke that. And Peter, he became a fisher of men. Do you know what that means? Jesus sent him out to go and capture people with Jesus' love. Amen. And so we had some really cool guys this week, the Gideons, and I wanted to give you all uh, some Bibles that he, uh, uh, Mr. Mackey gave us. And I don't know if you all have your own Bible or not, but this is a really cool little New Testament. And I want you all to know that on the front of it, there is a list of all kinds of things, topics, like anger or fear or even guidance. And so I wanted to give this to you all because this is the coolest and most beautiful gift that I ever got uh, when I was coming up. God's very holy word. Amen. And it's something that when you get, you can keep on giving it. Amen. But I love you kids so much. I hope you all have had a, a, an amazing time at VBS. Uh, what was your favorite thing about Vacation Bible School this week? You're not sure? Did y'all have a highlight, a moment? Are y'all just tired as me? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes all we need to do is pray. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Would y'all pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for these children. Uh, God, I ask that you will continue to give us your word. And Lord, that we would be a living word to everyone around us, God that we would truly catch others for Christ Jesus. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. All God's people say, amen, amen. Love y'all. Thank y'all. Let's be standing for all of the him.
Brother Don, would you please bless these tithes and offerings at this time? Good morning, everybody. Will you please stand with us and let's give God all our praise and glory this morning.
you right there, girl. Yeah, amen. That's all. Uh, amen. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Amen. That that was uh, the um, she was sharing with me this morning. That's the first. That's the first time she's been in in uh, in public in like and worship the Lord in that way. Thank you so much. I, I want to preach the gospel just as passionately as you presented it in song. Amen. And uh, I pray that all of us would have a desire to live the gospel as much as she had a passion and desire to sing it. Uh, and uh, if you've been following with us uh, the last few weeks, uh, we, we've been in the book of Judges, and we, we've been hitting some very interesting fellows in the book of Judges. Uh, this morning we're going to be in Judges chapter 15, and uh, provided the Holy Spirit leads a different way, that this will probably be the last time we're in the book of Judges for a little bit. Um, Judges 15, starting verse 9. Uh, a few weeks ago we looked at the life of Gideon, and then last week we looked at the life of uh, Jephthah. And this morning we're going to look at, I think, a judge that's very well known, this guy named Samson. Uh, can you say Samson? Yeah. We're, we're going to find out a lot about Samson this morning. Uh, how many of you have heard the Sunday school version of Samson? Amen. That's the cleaned up version. <laughs> Amen. Today we're going to get the real. Amen. We're going to look at God's word and uh, kind of investigate his life. And um, uh, but we're Judges chapter 15, uh, starting at verse 9, and we're going to read to verse uh, 20. Judges chapter 15, starting at verse 9, and we're going to go to verse 20. And when you get there, say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, very good. Uh, this is what took place in the life and times of the judges of Israel. Now the Philistines went up encamped in Judah, and deployed themselves against Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? So they answered, We have come up to arrest Samson, to do to him as he has done to us. Then three thousand men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Etam, and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is this you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I have done to them. But they said to him, We have come down to arrest you, that we may deliver you into the hands of the Philistines. And then Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. So they spoke to him, saying, No, but we will tie you securely and deliver you into their hand, but we will surely not kill you. And they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a what? A donkey. Reached out his hand and took it, and killed a thousand men with it. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've slain a thousand men. And so it was when he had finished speaking that he threw the jawbone from his hand and called the place Ramath Lehi, which means jawbone height. Then he became very thirsty. So he cried out to the Lord and said, You have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now I shall die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised. So God split the hollow place that is in Lehi, and water came out of it, and he drank. And his spirit returned, and he revived. Therefore he called its name in Hekor, which is spring of the caller, which is in Lehi to this day. And he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. And we'll stop right there. Would, would you pray with me? Father, as we engage in the word of God, it is my prayer that you will move my flesh out of the way, that the very Spirit of Jesus would minister to every heart, mind, and soul here, Lord, knowing fully well that everyone that you've assembled in this place, Lord, that we have come to hear a word that you have prepared for us. God, that you would convict us, grow us, transform us, Lord. Let no one leave here unchanged by your eternal living word. And we pray all this by the name of Jesus, we all say, amen and amen. Uh, and so most of you may know this story, but to, to get uh, the background of this, the Israelites have their new land, their new freedom, and Samson is their 12th judge by the time of this book. 
12 judges. Six times Israel did this same cycle. They received freedom, they got comfortable, they began to worship false gods, and then other nations began to oppress them. They would oppress them so harshly that they would call out to the God they rejected, and then God would raise up a savior or a deliverer named uh, as, as a judge. The judge would come in and deliver them from the, the people that had them in captivity, and then they'd be set free, and then they would, yeah, we're free, and then they would get comfortable, then they would reject their God again, and another nation would come up. And listen, this is six times. Samson is the sixth time they've been in this cycle, and this is the saddening part. This is the last cycle we see in Judges, and at the, at the end, we don't see God redeem them. We just have this moment where it's the sixth time, and we know that six and seven are very important numbers in the Bible. Seven uh, describes what kind of a number is it? Completion, rest, it's a perfect number. So the number six always represents mankind. We're just one day away from being what? At peace. We're one day away from being complete in him. We're one day away from experiencing him. Listen, many of you, and, and there's been days in my life where I stopped on day six. Amen? Where we stopped on day six. God's trying to get us to day seven. He's trying to get us to a place of his peace and his presence. But Israel is left in this moment, the cycle. And here's what's the most saddening thing is Samson was the most promising judge out of all of them. He had the most power. He had the most blessing. He had the most gifting. He had the most miraculous story. I mean, he was absolutely someone that, that could have led Israel well and did such an amazing job. But what we find here is Samuel is the worst, uh, well, the worst example of the judges. And this is rough. How many of you have looked at somebody and they're like, they have so much promise? Have you ever like looked at, they have so much promise? And you're like, yeah, pastor, every day I look in that mirror. <laughs> and I'm like, I have so much promise. You have to understand, Samson had a childhood. He had parents. They raised him. And uh, they saw that promise in him. They were given a story from God about that promise. But Samson never stepped into the role of faith and calling that God equipped him for, called him for. He perpetuated the same cycle that Israel had been in for so long. And uh, if you forget who the real enemy is, you will fight those closest to you. And that's what Israel does. Israel forgot who the real enemy was, and Israel, by the end of the book of Judges, they are at war with one another. And, and you must understand this. Every person who has given their heart and soul to Jesus, we have an enemy, and his sole purpose is to destroy God's kingdom, to pull his family apart. And if he can't get your soul, he will make you useless to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what Samson, he put himself in a position where he was no longer a help for his people. His name in uh, Hebrew is uh, Shimshon. Go ahead and say Shimshon. It sounds like an infomercial thing that you buy. Amen. Come uh, buy this Shimshon. Amen. But his name actually means a deliverer of Israel. That his, his very name means deliverer of Israel, and he was actually to be a deliverer, but he was actually more of a disappointment. He caused division and destruction wherever he went. And I wish to let you know that every one of us were called into a purpose that is supposed to bring life. But if you've ever lived apart from that path that God has called you, what you will bring is everything but life and joy where you go. He's called us to be a people after his own name. And I want you to know that his birth was miraculous. Turn back to Judges chapter 13. It's a miraculous birth here. Judges 13, start at verse 1. And I want to read just a, a few verses with you just to establish what kind of birth he did. Do any of you remember the day you were born? I hope not. Amen. Here is Samuel's uh, story here. Uh, Judges 13. Uh, uh, Samson's uh, journey. Uh, Judges 13, verse 1. Again, the children of Israel did what was what? Evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for how long? Forty years. Now there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of Danites, 
And his name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you have been barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. And therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from womb, and he shall deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So the woman came and told her husband these things. And we'll, we'll stop right there. So here's Samson's beginning. It's miraculous. The angel of the Lord, and as I said a while back, whenever you see the Lord in all caps, what does that mean? That's God's personal name in the Hebrew. That's Y-H-W-H, sounds like breathing, Yahweh. Very interesting. The angel of the Lord came to her, spoke this prophecy. You who can have no children, you are going to bear a son, and he's going to deliver Israel. What does this sound like, New Testament people? This sounds like Jesus, the story of Jesus. This is very interesting that an angel came, uh, his name was Gabriel, came to Mary, said you're going to deliver a son, uh, a son that was going to come from somebody who should not have been able to bear a son. She was a virgin. Manoah's wife was barren. This is miraculous. This is a miraculous birth. He's going to be a miraculous child. He's going to be a miracle child. And he was going to be a Nazarite, meaning no, uh, no strong drink, no unclean thing to touch his lips. And he could not cut his what? His hair. Man, wouldn't that be wild? If you were growing up and, and everybody in your family is just like, why aren't you cutting that boy's hair? He's a Nazarite. No razor shall touch his head. And so his hair had been growing since he was just a babe. This is just extraordinary. Uh, and because he is to live a holy life and he was a special child, I believe that his parents probably treated him different. How do you think that maybe his parents treated him? Have you ever said this, that that little child is so spoiled? Have you ever met anyone spoiled? No way. You No. No one's spoiled. I, I tried to come up with a good definition of what spoiled means. I want to see if you all agree with me, okay? Spoiled is when you set no parameters on a child, their whims. Spoiled happens when you set no parameter on a child's whims. Meaning this, that whatever their whim is, that's their way. And so when you know, set no parameters, when you give no guidance, uh, you give them whatever they want, but you never teach them self-control, boundaries, a patience, focus, vision. What they get a taste for is comfort and uh, relaxation. And they're led by whatever they want. I saw a child uh, once uh, playing with other kids, and this little boy picked up a whole train set walked up to another little boy and just threw the whole train set on top of the other kid. I mean, with all of his might, he just walked up, picked up this whole train set. Wow, right? And everybody, all the adults jumped over like, no, oh, wow, no. And the child's father said, why did you do that? I don't know. I mean, how many of you have, like, have seen this moment happen where you ask it, why did you do that? I don't know. I want to tell you, most of the time, kids really don't know what they do. They really, man, there's not a lot going on up there sometimes. But he says, I don't know. And he says, well, you hurt this person. Why did you do that? He goes, well, I just wanted to see what would happen. <laughs> and so the dad looked at him and goes, you apologize right now. He says, no, I don't want to. Well, you apologize right now. No, it makes me feel bad. If you don't apologize to him, I'm going to have to apologize for you. Ooh, that is not a good direction. You know, I'm a Macedonia boy. I was raised right here in this community. My parents taught me discipline. That when I stepped out of the parameters that they'd given me for my safety and for the safety of others, that there would be consequences. My parents never abused me. They never mistreated me. But they always taught me right from wrong and that there was always consequences for my actions. There are many children. They're getting 
the Samson treatment. Because I believe that Samson got whatever he wanted. He was called to a holy life, but he wholly lived it for himself. And, and Christians, we have been called to a holy life, but are you living your life on your own terms? The whole theme of the book of Judges is that everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. They were doing whatever felt good to them. Look at this next chapter. Look at, uh, jump down with me a little ways. Look at uh, Judges 14, verse 1. This is right after he's born and uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. And so he's a little older now. He's been growing up. And it says, Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah, the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for me as what? My wife. Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren? And among all the people, that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, get her for me. For she what? She pleased him. She makes me happy. But his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at the time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother, came into the vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise, a young what? A young lion roaring against him came. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one would tear a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. I, I want to stop right there. There's some interesting things that take place. One, it says that he saw a woman in Timnah, and then he, he said, I've seen a woman in Timnah. Listen, I, I wish to tell you that uh, this word seen or saw in the Hebrew is uh, raha. Can you say raha? raha? That's what you say when you catch uh, your spouse eating without you. Uh, raha! <laughs> You're having a secret snack. You saw them. They're eating something without you. This is the same word that God uses in Genesis 1 where he says he saw that it was good. He saw about creation. It's the same word that is used in Genesis 3 when it says Eve saw that the fruit was good. Your eyes will get you into a lot of trouble. A glimpse can make you stumble, but a stare can make you fall. And Samson, he didn't just glimpse, he stared. He goes, I like that girl over there. I asked a young man, I was like, why are you dating that girl? And he goes, because she's hot, Pastor Chris. And I was like, whoa, buddy, that should not be the emphasis for everything in life, because things change. <laughs> right? You know, <laughs> don't date anybody because they look good. Find somebody who is good. Find somebody who knows the good God. Because he wanted to be united with somebody who was unequally yoked with him faith-wise. This isn't about a culture or skin color here. It's all about philosophy and faith. And many of us link ourselves with people who have different philosophy, different faith, and then we wonder why we have problems in life because you don't even know what to teach your kids. Because there's not one sole truth you're going towards. Samson didn't care. He just liked how it looked. And he was led by wherever that led him. Uh, Christians, I, I wish to tell you that as Samson, he is feeding into all of the things that make him weak. And so as he's going along this, this, um, this idea of I'm going to go and do it my way, he comes across a lion, he kills the lion, but he doesn't tell who. His parents. So right here, early on in his life, he's already establishing a pattern for his life. He sees what he likes, he goes and get it, and then he's begin to keep secrets from those that he's supposed to love the most. Secrets and lies will kill you. Secrets and lies will kill relationships, will kill future, and he did something and he didn't share it with those who gave him life. I want you to consider this, that one of the most important aspects of any relationship is communication, transparency. And there's things that you might not want to share with somebody that actually might save your relationship, save your life, it will save your future. Because Jesus has come to set us free from the things that hold us captive. 
Samson's already establishing a pattern that will leave him down a bad, bad road. God is going to get his glory, though. Did you hear in this passage that God was going to use Samson to free them from Israel? But what God was using was Samson's brokenness. God actually wishes to use our faithfulness. But I want to tell you this. God, he will always get his glory. Whether it's by our brokenness or by our faithfulness, he will get his glory and he will, uh, his, his will will be done. But I would rather do it because of my what? Faithfulness. Not my own brokenness. But I'm so glad that God's a merciful God. Amen. Uh, look a little ways down. So we're about to read the most lit wedding in the history of human humanity. This is the most lit wedding. If you think that you went to a rough wedding, you have not been to this wedding here. Uh, look a little further. Look at verse 10 of chapter 14. Uh, so he kills that lion. And uh, th this, is, this is what takes place after that moment. Uh, it says, So his father went down to the woman, and Samson gave a feast there for, for young men to be uh, used to do, as, as young men used to do so. And it happened when he saw him that about 30 companions went to be with him. Then Samson said to them, let me pose a little riddle to you. If you can correctly solve and explain it to me within seven days of the feast, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 uh, changes of clothing. But if you cannot explain it to me, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. And he said to them, pose your riddle that we may hear it. And so he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something what? Sweet. Now for three days they could not explain the, the riddle. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they came to Samson's who? His wife. The one he was willing to burn the world down to obtain. Amen. And they said, entice your husband that he may explain the riddle to us, or else we will burn you and your father's house with fire. That's rough. I told you it's a lit wedding. Have you invited us in order to take what is ours? That is not so. When Samson's wife wept on him and said, You only hate me. You do not love me. You have posed a riddle to, my sons, to the sons of my people, but you have not explained it to me. And he said to her, Look, I have not explained it to my father or my mother, so should I explain it to you too? Now, she had did what? Wept for how long? Seven days. This is their entire length of the wedding service. A week. She cried all week, and uh, while, while he feasted, <laughs> wow, uh, and it happened on the seventh day that he told her because she pressed him so much. Then she explained the riddle to the sons of the people, so the men of the city told him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And, and this guy said, you, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would have never solved my riddle. Did y'all catch that? He called his new bride a cow. I just want to let you know that on your wedding day, you should never look at the lady that you're about to spend the rest of your life with. like, you're so my cow. You know, you should, you should never, that's not a term of endearment in any way, shape, or form. And he's so mad. And so it says in verse 19, then the spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily and he went down to Ashkelon. He killed 30 men there took their stuff and gave the clothing to the guys that got the riddle right. So his anger was aroused and he went back up to his father's house and Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his what? Best man. This is the most lit wedding in the history of human, humanity. Samson was so mad, he left. He was the runaway groom. He left the wedding left the scene, and here's the bride, here's the best man. They're like, well, somebody's getting married today. And they gave Samson's, the lady he saw, love so much to his best man. I want you to just kind of think in your minds what that might do to you if you were Samson. Because in Samson's mind, he was mad. He's going to go and he's going to cool off. He's going to come back and make everything right. He's going to marry this lady. When he comes back and he finds out that the, the, the father's bride gave her to his best friend, he went berserk. He went crazy. His, his, um, 
spoiled little child inside of him went crazy. He set the fields of the Philistines on fire. He went ballistic. He killed a bunch of people. And then when, Philist when the Philistines finally rose up, they went against Ju Judah, his own people came to give him to them. I want you to consider that Samson lived in such a way that he didn't even have a real friend. He was completely isolated and alone. He had nobody. His best friend did what to him? Well, I'll marry her. That's not friendship. I just want to let you know that. Samson is alone because Samson was the only one who mattered. Samson was the only one who was special. He was God's chosen one. And so when they handed him over to the Philistines, he did what Samson always does. He broke that ra the, the, the rope like it was nothing. He picked up a donkey's jawbone and he killed a thousand guys. And then after all that, he fell down and he, he complained, Lord, am I now going to die of thirst after I've been doing all your work? I want you to consider this. Some of us think we're living under blessing when we're actually living under mercy. We're just going around, we're like, man, I'm so blessed. But actually, it's because God is so merciful and graceful. Mercy is what we don't get that we deserve. Amen? I am a recipient of his grace and his mercy. But when I began to surrender more and more and more of my life, he began to demand more and more from my life. Because he's called us not to live how we want to. He's called us to live a new life. A brand new life. A place that has living water that never runs dry. Here's Samson, he's drinking water that's going to be gone. But it's the first time we see Samson pray. We saw Gideon pray. He prayed. But what he was doing was he was looking for a sign. Jephthah prayed, but what he was looking for was victory. Samson, when he prays, he's always looking for revenge or vengeance. Are you going to let me die of thirst so my, that my enemies can laugh at me? Because Samson was always about his image and how he looked, and it was about pride. So he reigns, he reigns 20 years after this. But he never took care of the things that he should have broke away from. So we find him in chapter 16. Look at chapter 16, verse 1 with me. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and they lay wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night saying, in the morning when it is daylight, we will what? Kill him. Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight. He, told, he took hold of the doors of the gate of the city the two gateposts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his, what? Shoulders, and carried them up on the top of a hill that faces Hebron. He did that because he could. I want you to just have this picture in your mind. Here's Samson, chosen with miraculous birth. He picks up a whole gate, two, two posts, puts them on his shoulders, and walks up a hill. What does that sound like? Jesus carried the cross, two pieces of wood, up a hill. But you see, whereas Samson went up there, he went up on the hill for himself. Jesus went up on the hill for all of us. Samson went up that hill to see how strong I am. Jesus came in our likeness, and he surrendered to flesh and the death that it came with. But he never surrendered to sin. He never surrendered to the baser nature of that flesh. He gave himself completely to the Father. And he has called us to do the same, to be crucified in Christ Jesus. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the very will of God. For the man who loves me, the Savior who died for me, Christians, this is a foreshadowing here. And so what Samson does is he falls in love with this lady named Delilah. Can you say Delilah? She was another Philistine lady. I bet she was hot, right? 
And I told that young man, you know, hell is hot too. <laughs> right? Hot is not always good. Have you tried hot ice cream? Not good. Not good. We see here Delilah, her name actually means this, to bring low. Oh man, ain't that deep? Delilah's very root word means to bring low. And so as they entered into this relationship, look at how this plays out in verse 4. Afterward, it happens that he loved a woman in the valley of Sarek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, entice him and find out where his great strength lies and by what means he may, we may overpower him that we may bind him to afflict him and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. Man, this is rough. It says that Samson loved her, but it never says Delilah loved him. I want you to consider this. The hand you hold, the head, when you lay your head in someone's lap or on your shoulder, they can define your future. Whoever you marry, you're marrying their family as well. Whoever you link yourself up with, you are linking yourself with everything they carry with them. And Delilah, it seems like she's spoiled. I bet Delilah has always got what Delilah wanted. And here's the most ironic thing. When two spoiled people come together, watch out world. It's going to get lit right here. And so as they are in this relationship, the first thing she does is ask him, and he says, well, if you tie up my hands with seven fresh new bowstrings, then I will be subdued. And it just so happened that night, after they spent time together, that Samson woke up with seven fresh bowstrings tied around his wrists, and Delilah saying, awake, Samson, the Philistines are upon us, the Philistines are upon us. And Samson gets up, snaps it off, beats him up, and goes lay back down. And she says, you lied to me. Uh, all right, I know that Samson probably is not the sharpest tack in the tool shed, but he literally just told this lady his secret, his secret. He lied to her. He did. And so she said, you lied to me. And so he told her uh, again. He goes, well, if you use new, new ropes, then I'll be subdued. And he just what happened, spent time with her, fell asleep, woke up with rope, new ropes around his wrists, to the Philistines are coming. He gets up, snaps it off, beats him up, goes, lays back down. Again, and she's even more mad. She's even more embarrassed. You lied to me. You're making me look bad. And, and so, y'all see what's happening? Samson's playing with her. Because Samson, people aren't people to him. To Samson, people are something that are tools or obstacles. He doesn't see any of them as human beings. And the, the, uh, the, what he was trying to love, he didn't even have a love to love. If he truly loved Delilah, well, if he truly loved the Lord as God, I don't think he'd been with Delilah. So that third time, she said, tell me, tell me, tell me. And he says, okay, okay, okay. If you take the locks of my hair and weave it, the seven locks, into a loom, whoa, man. That's getting close, what? To the truth. She's breaking him down, breaking him down. And he just so happens to wake up with his seven locks in a, in a loom. The Philistines are upon you, Samson. He gets up, snaps that, beats him up, goes lay back down. Again, a third time. And this time, she nags him unto death. Nags him unto death. And he's just tired. He's been broken down. He can't get a good night's rest. I mean, my goodness. Every time he goes to sleep, he wakes up with some new torture, right? He wakes up and he tells her, Well, no razor has ever touched my head. And so we know this story. She dolls him and gets him to lay on her lap. And she has a Philistine man come in there and shave his head 
as he's just passed out because he had been indulging in things he never should have had. Have no strong drink, eat nothing unclean. You know that lion he killed in the beginning of the story? He came back by and there was honey growing out of it and he reached in and took life from what was dead. He was living outside of God's law, outside of God's will. As in the Torah, you're not supposed to take what was uh, life from the death. You cannot eat a boiled calf in its mother's milk. That's actually a law in Leviticus. And you know why that is. And by the way, that's a burrito, by the way. And I love burritos. I do. But the reason why is the law is always making a stipulation between life and death, righteousness and and wickedness. It's trying to show us his will. He was living outside of it. He was drinking strong drink. He was living his life on his own terms. And so when Delilah said, Samson, wake up. The Philistines are upon you. He woke up, but it says in the scriptures, you can look for yourself, but the Lord had departed from him. He woke up to do what he's always done, and he couldn't do it. And they took him. They gouged his eyes out. And they made him a slave. And they put him in a place where everybody can see him work for the Philistines now. He was grinding grain for them. They took his vision, but if we're very honestly, he lost his vision a long time ago. And there's a lot of things we want to make excuse and we want to blame, but what we really have to do is look at where we lost the vision, where we lost the, the, the step that we should have taken towards him and we took for ourselves. And Samson, in that time of his torture, it says in the word that his hair began to do what? Grow back. And what we see here, look at verse 28 of chapter 16. Samson called to capital letters, Lord, saying, O Yahweh, my Elohim, he says. What does he say? Remember me. I pray, strengthen me. I pray just this once, O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines over my, what? <laughs> my two eyes. Then Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple. He braced himself against them, and with one on his right and the other on his left, Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might. The temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed in his life were more than what he killed. The, the, he killed at his death were more than what he killed in his life. And his brothers and his father's house, did you catch that? His brothers. His mother was what? Barren. God's good. She had other sons. His brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Ishtul. Oh, I'll stop right there. What we have here is the beginning of his reign and the end. And what we have is 20 years of wasteful living. And I want to just tell you this, because there's been moments and seasons in our life where we'll look back and we're like, God, man, I lost a lot during those years. I want to tell you this. I want you to pray this. Lord, restore and multiply the years the locust devoured. Because I tell you what, he's a faithful God. He will restore and multiply those years. Samson, in his defeat, he said, Lord, remember me. And he took his right hand and his left hand. And by those two hands, he brought destruction and deliverance to Israel. I want you to consider this. Samson did that to take life. Jesus did this to save it. Amen. Jesus stretched his arms out open wide. And they're still wide open. I'm so glad I didn't wait for things to line up for me. I just waited on God. I waited to step. There's moments that I didn't always wait. There's moments that I've walked under God's grace and mercy. But he wants us to step into the blessing he has for you. But it always starts at Calvary. 
But just one thing, before Jesus ever gave his life on Calvary, he gave himself up in the Garden of Gethsemane. I like how Jesus prayed. Gideon, he prayed for a sign. Jephthah, he prayed for victory. Samson prayed for revenge. Jesus prayed to give himself. I know that a lot of us, we go to prayer and we're asking, but the greatest thing you can ever give God is just you. Just you. Would you please stand as we go to the Lord in prayer? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we just approach the end of this service, but Lord, possibly the beginning of a new life for somebody, Lord, I ask that as we approach the invitation, Lord, that we would turn ourselves over to you. God, that we would allow you to do the pruning, the transforming, the changing, God, because we can't do it on our own. Because our, our strength, our, our love is not sufficient, Lord. You are the one who is sufficient. God, be with us in this moment. And Lord, might we give to you what you so deserve. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Uh, praise the Lord. Thank you all so much uh, for, for uh, singing to the Lord. I do have some really cool news. Uh, one, uh, Nikki, would you please come here? Uh, this is Nikki. She's been visiting with us for, for quite some time, and, and uh, she actually began to look for churches because she wants to raise her, her young son, Luke, in a, a church that teaches biblical truth. That's something that was upon her heart. And uh, she's been coming, and she even served during vacation Bible school. I mean, she did. My goodness. And, uh, and listen, it was one of those things where she agreed to help, and she stepped up, and the person who was going to help her dropped out at the last moment. But she still did it. And, and, and she wants to make this her home. Uh, so if that makes you happy, say amen. You know, uh, very, very good. Uh, my goodness. Uh, man, oh, man. And uh, then, uh, and Ryan, would you please come here? Uh, this is Ryan Gatlin, and, and all, uh, some of y'all know this, but he married uh, uh, Miss Jacqueline. That's Jody's daughter. And, and, um, and God put them together, and they have a family, and he wants to come today to profess Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. <laughs> So, really cool, amen, uh, uh, the angels rejoice, amen, and I think we should make a noise, so uh, be in prayer as he's walking and stepping out in faith, and he's going to lead his family in the ways of the Lord, and so just be in prayer for him, uh, just be, and, and pray for both families, amen, as they make decisions, and Jody, how cool is this? Why don't you stand by this cool dude, amen, and, and, and by these, uh, and, and so please uh, uh, encourage them and, uh, uh, and be in prayer for them as, as God is leading them on their journey, amen, and, and just praise God for a beautiful day in the Lord, amen. So uh, well, I'm going to pray, and we're going to dismiss, and so I hope you all have a beautiful rest of the day, and uh, we, we, we love you all, amen. Uh, Lord Jesus, uh, thank you for how you move and work, and God, I want to lift up the two families that are represented here that will actually be represented by through generations, Lord. The things they decide today make will be the future generations' successes or at sometimes failures. And so, Lord, we as this generation, might we choose you, Lord, that we can make it just a little easier for that next generation to choose you. God, be with us as we depart and bring us all back together tonight at 7 to do it all over again. We pray this in Jesus' name. All God's people say, Amen. Amen.